The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because generally they're the same people. Loneliness is an absolute bitch. This is coming from someone who loves to be alone. But as we all certainly know by this point, being alone and being lonely are two very different things. Social isolation can be detrimental to our health in more ways than one. In 2020, when COVID-19 officially became a pandemic and social distancing and shelter in place became the new normal, the sudden isolation proved difficult for many people. Even the introverts, who usually dwell in solitude, found themselves in distress. Researchers Danilo Stock and Robin Dunbar conducted a study which was later published in Cell Press. The Neurobiology of Social Distancing began with a declaration that summed up social interaction and the detriment of its absence clearly and concisely. In short, loneliness kills people. The study goes into detail about the benefits and the importance of forming social bonds, of the impact that loneliness has on us psychologically, and even more interesting, the impairment loneliness places on our immune system. Loneliness impairs the immune system and reduces resistance to diseases and infections. Research has found that freshman students who reported feeling lonely had a reduced immune system response when they were given a flu vaccine compared to students who felt socially well engaged. I know what you're thinking. I thought this video was about Colossal, not about how lonely I am. It is, I promise. It's important that we acknowledge how important social bonds are to us and to our health, how loneliness can weaken our immune systems and our minds. I mean, the World Health Organization declared that loneliness was a worldwide major health concern. And how many of us, obviously, fear being lonely more than we fear anything else? Because that fear of being alone and the knowledge that solitude has bad side effects is often what puts us into bad relationships and eventually keeps us from ditching shitty fucking friends. And yeah, Colossal is about Anne Hathaway being a monster on the other side of the world, but it's also very much about the monsters we face in real life, such as ourselves, and more threatening, the bad friends we're surrounded with. Colossal is a pretty simple story. Anne Hathaway plays Gloria, a writer in the Big Apple who's going through a difficult time. Though the movie never outright says the word, it's pretty heavily implied that she's an alcoholic. Her boyfriend, Tim, is very critical of her behavior and, at the start of the film, kicks her out of his apartment. After this moment, we see the first instance of Gloria having shitty friends. She's just been dumped and displaced. She's clearly spaced out and sad, but her friends don't seem to notice and, more importantly, they don't really seem to care. <laughs> Their only concern is fun. It becomes clear that Gloria is a pretty anxious person. She has a few nervous tics that she repeats during moments of distress, like pulling at her hair and scratching her scalp. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's this nervous tick I have. I um, I get this itch right here. You look like a monkey. I look like a monkey. And throughout the movie, you notice how often she seems to be in distress, whether that stress is a reaction to her environment or a reflection of her inner turmoil. With nowhere else to go, Gloria returns to her old neighborhood and starts living in her childhood home. There, she runs into her elementary school friend, Oscar, played by a very cunning Jason Sudeikis. They catch up and become fast friends again. He takes her to his bar, she meets his friends Joel and Garth, everything's kosher. Gloria didn't arrive with any furniture and she's been sleeping on the floor, so Oscar brings her furniture that she doesn't remember asking for. Well, a sofa. Yeah, you wanted the sofa. I wanted a sofa. But happily accepts. He brings her a TV and much later in the movie, furnishes her entire house. Oh yeah, he also gives her a job at his bar. She's adjusting to being back home when the news breaks that there's a monster appearing in Seoul, South Korea. Everyone is glued to their screens, awaiting for more news about the monster. People have theories on where it's appearing from, what it wants, if it's going to show up in other places. And one day, while watching the news, Gloria sees the monster and notices something incredible. It's her. The monster is her. Holy fuck. So she reveals this to the gang, and in her excitement, she swats down a helicopter. <laughs> Ow, what was that? What was that? A helicopter crashed. Into my head? Yeah. And with the, with like the pilot and everything? Oscar steps onto the playground to help her and then she trips and falls, absolutely decimating everything in front of her. She finds out about the damage the next day, waking up to the news and to Oscar coming into her house with groceries. Oh, you're up. I, I, I took your keys because I didn't want to wake you when I got back. He tells her about the damage and shows her what happened when he stepped on the playground. 
a giant robot manifested next to her monster and soul. The lore on how they're able to transform into monsters halfway across the world is a little silly, but I'm not one to look a gift magical realism horse in the mouth, and the why isn't nearly as important as what the knowledge of this ability does to them both. After the destruction she accidentally causes to the city, Gloria writes a note in the sand apologizing for the incident and saying it won't happen again. She turns over a new leaf and she stops drinking. She makes it her mission to never visit the playground again. But Oscar has different ideas. He taunts innocent people for jest. Gloria stops him, showing him up not only in front of his friends, but in front of an entire city. His ego is bruised. This is something the movie shows steadily in little ways from the beginning. When Gloria comes back to town, he brings up something from the past that he's been holding on to for all of these years. <laughs> when we were kids back in school, Every year they would, they, they'd have this uh, short story contest in the spring, and Gloria here would <laughs> always win, always. Oh, come on, my stories were terrible. Oh, um, yeah, well, <laughs> apparently they were better than mine, so. <laughs> he believes that because of the way he perceives Gloria's success. Oh, and by the way, she even says herself that she's not that successful. She didn't have a place of her own, she couldn't get a job for a year, and had no money when she moved back home. But the way he perceives Gloria's success, he believes that she believes that she's better than him. His carefully crafted demeanor of being a kind-hearted, gracious person is an act that starts to crack little by little. He masks his passionate envy with a personable temperament. When he finds out that Gloria has this special power, this strange ability to appear as a monster, but only for a limited amount of time and only in one place, he's jealous. When he finds out he can do the same thing, he runs with it to show her up. No, you think everything revolves around you, but it doesn't! Not anymore! Oscar. My life is just as amazing as yours now! For once! And if you don't like it, fuck you! And this is where the story begins to shine so beautifully, I could cry. It's a monster movie about interpersonal relationships, how we make them and maintain them, and how we break them apart. It's about the monsters we meet in real life, the ones who look normal and act nice but worm their way into our lives through manipulation and deceit. Gloria is a monster, but when she realizes that, she chooses not to be. She chooses to be her better self, to fight those demons. Whereas Oscar takes his revelation as a sign that he has a power, power that needs to be wielded, power that can make him feel bigger than he does. Both of them have already had their bad habits and their faults make them feel like monsters. The difference is that when faced with their faults, Gloria takes to improving herself while Oscar exacerbates his worst qualities. Oscar's ego has been bruised since elementary school, since Gloria was a good writer and since she left town for New York. And that bruise has been getting worse for years. He holds onto his envy and his hatred and he blames her for all the things he didn't do. And so after being humiliated, he makes her do the one thing that will make him feel better about himself. If you drink that beer, I'll go take a walk through the uh, park later. By forcing her to indulge in something he knows brings out the worst in her, he can be better than her. He even drags Garth into this by bringing up his past struggles with addiction. Hell, Garth here's been doing coke in secret for the last five years, no one here judges him, right? Fuck you. You can go to hell. Mm. I'm leaving. Okay, see you, buddy. You're lucky that the rest of us don't have I your- I thought you were leaving! Reminding his friends of their shortcomings to make himself feel better about himself and to, in no uncertain terms, remind them of their place. He surrounds himself with the people that he can lord himself over. All the gifts he gives Gloria, the furniture, the groceries, the job, they're all just ways for him to gain control over her life. In 2016, researchers Nak Young Hun, Park Yu Bin, and Park Son Wung found that narcissists give gifts not to show appreciation for someone, but to make others appreciate them. They use gift giving as a means of buffing their own self-image and in other cases to gain control over the recipient. Oscar is that kind of toxic friend. He constantly compares himself to Gloria, he reminds her of her mistakes, he threatens her, he manipulates her, and when she tries to confront him about it, he gets emotional to make her feel bad for being angry. Before she stopped drinking, he would even take advantage of her being drunk by telling her that he asked her to do things or she asked him for favors, knowing full well that she wouldn't remember the conversation. Well, a sofa. Yeah, you wanted a sofa. I wanted a sofa? Oh, I gotta say, this is a this is a pretty nice surprise. What, the TV? Yeah. No, we, we talked about this last night. 
His knowledge that she's trying to better herself is what drives him to torment Soul, not just to feel powerful, but to remind Gloria of the power he has over her, that he can force her to do things she doesn't want to do so long as he's able to hurt people that she's trying to protect. Oscar and Gloria aren't romantic, but their dynamic echoes that of abuse within romantic relationships. Oscar has a warped crush on Gloria and has since childhood. When Joel almost kisses her shortly after they meet and after the two of them have sex, Oscar is enraged. From the moment he reunites with Gloria, their reunion seems sweet, and then he does all of these nice things, but he's crossing a line each and every time. When the writer-director, Nacho Vigarondo, started on this film, one of the things he set out to do was deconstruct the romantic comedy and some of the not-great things that happen in rom-coms, the ones that border on stalker territory. With Oscar and Gloria, he was able to set up this idea of a rom-com only to reveal its true nature. Oscar comes in like a knight in shining armor, and then you realize he's the dragon and he needs to be slayed. Oscar isn't the only representation of the bad friends we have in our lives. Joel and Tim, Gloria's ex-boyfriend, are practically as bad. Joel doesn't do anything to stop Oscar from terrorizing Gloria, and Tim has never been supportive of her. He constantly tells her what to do and reminds her of how poorly she's doing, even when he knows she's proud of her accomplishments. You can do whatever you want. Except find a job and take care of myself, right? Oh, yeah, because you're really doing that. You're just, you're doing just great. Just great. You move back home, working as a waitress. She gives her first job in a year, and because it's not a writing job, he belittles her for it. She doesn't really have anyone that genuinely supports her or wants the best for her. And it's very easy for us to fall into that, because sometimes the alternative to bad friends isn't always good friends. Sometimes it's just no friends at all. Sometimes we know our friends are terrible for us, and we know we'd be better off without them, but we tolerate them and are placed with them, because who wants to be alone? Oscar does exactly what he said he would. He overpowers Gloria and kills a bunch of people. She sees no way out of it, but she finds a way to outsmart him by flying to Korea, which makes her monster alternative show up in her small town, where she can overtake Oscar with ease. She has a moment when she's got him but she hesitates. And this hesitation is almost identical to the hesitation we feel in real life when it comes time to cut out toxic friends. It mirrors the way he's emotionally manipulated her in the past whenever she's tried to confront him. Despite her hesitance, she overcomes it. The moral is simple. Sometimes you can't cut bad friends out of your life, and when that happens, you can always pick them up as your kaiju self and throw them as far as the eye can see. At the very end of the movie, Gloria goes into a bar and asks the bartender if they would like to hear an amazing story. The bartender says yes and asks her if she wants a drink. And Gloria... <sighs> and I just love this ending. Because we can cut our bad friends loose and we can change our environment and those things can help, but in the end, we still have to hold ourselves accountable if we want a change. Sometimes that can be the hardest thing, but without removing the people in your life who have a total disregard for your well-being, it's even harder to get to that stage. So do yourself a favor and drop the fuck out of your bad friends today.